darkness falls, it won't prevail. Cause the God I serve knows only how to try. Romans 8, 28. You take what the enemy meant for you. Turn it for good. Turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for you. And you turn it for good. You turn it for good. Start to sound like you believe it.
I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you. I just think it's really important that we stand in the gap for each other. Anybody praying for a prodigal? You take what the enemy meant for evil. You turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil. Lord, you turn it for good. You turn it for good. Speak it over your prodigal right now. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. Yeah. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. Yes, I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to
miracles happen when you move. Healing is coming in this room. Miracles happen when you move. Heaven is coming. Miracles happen when you move. Healing is coming. Make some confessions. Anybody been set free from drugs or some other like really binding thing that was holding you down? How good is God? You're so good to us. Something marvelous happened to me. I was a prisoner. Your love broke me free. I was blind in unbelief, but you make me see. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Help me out on spot, right? Because I am living proof that my God is on the move. There's nothing that he can do. Faith rise on. Faith rise on. Sing that again. I am. I am living proof that my God is on the move. There's nothing that he can't do. Faith rise up, faith rise up. Something marvelous happened, Lord, when you set us free. Something scandalous 
happened to me. I was a criminal, but your blood washed me clean. I was destined for the grave, but you rose for me. Just ask you to move mightily in our midst tonight. I am evidence that my God is real. I am a miracle. My heart has been healed. Come and witness for and he is revealed Hallelujah Stretch your faith. Help me see it, Lord. Help me see it. If I can see it, I can have it. As we're worshiping, I just kept hearing the Lord say, there's a miracle seed inside every one of us who have received Jesus Christ. 
And the Lord says, have faith and believe that that miracle seed is going to burst forth and bring forth your complete healing and breakthrough. And Father, we thank you for the miracle seed that we receive when we receive your son, Jesus. He is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above, more than we can ever ask or imagine in Jesus' name. Water that seed. Water that seed. Oh, a miracle power in my life. let the Lord reveal a picture to you right now. Just stir up the gifts that are inside of you. Show you something that looks impossible. Nothing's too hard for you, Lord. place today, in my life today, in this region, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, let's give the Lord a standing ovation. He deserves it. Let's welcome Ken back as he comes back for round two. Hello. All right, we made it back from lunch. If you feel tempted to fall into a food coma, stand up. <laughs> um, I thought I would do just a short merch pitch. Uh, we got a ton of stuff on the table out there. There's no way I could show you everything that we've got. But um, this is the message I'm about to do when some are not healed. If you want to own your own personal copy, there you go. You might even persuade me to autograph it if you were really keen, but maybe you don't care. Um, five steps to healing. John Wimber, years ago, came up with something that he called the five-step healing model. I've heard it taught by different people. I've, I was dissatisfied with most of the, what I heard because it had become rote. It, didn't, it wasn't really reflecting the mind of a practitioner. I was there when John was thinking about this and was creating it and teaching it, so I did my own take on it. I did it in a church in Mississippi, I guess it was about four or five years ago, and um, <clears throat> the pastor came up to me afterward and he said, I've taught that material over a hundred times, and about five minutes into the message I realized I didn't know what I was talking about <laughs> as I listened to what you were doing with it. So anyway, maybe that's interesting to you. It gives you some idea of our kind of baseline methodology. It's not everything you could know about healing, of course, but it's just a, gives you a place to start. Healing is the children's bread. This is the title of our conference. I haven't done this message, but you never know, it could show up. Um, this one, basic healing, I only brought a couple sets of it because it's big and fat and giant. Uh, this morning's message was part of one of the other messages that's in there, so it's just a sub-segment. There's a bunch of other messages. I have two copies of this in DVD and two copies in CD that are on the table. This particular one in my hand, and only this particular one in my hand, um, somehow got damaged coming out here. The case did its job and protected the discs, so they're still playable, but there's a little bit of a crunch there. 
And because of that, if you want this one, you can get it for $10 off if you decide you want to buy it. And Lily can help you with that. Uh, when this, again, if you want to buy it at all. No pressure. Um, once you move beyond basic healing, you need intermediate healing, so we have that. I'm not doing anything out of this series this weekend, but if you were interested in it, there it is. Um, and then we have this three-part series on God's will is to heal. A lot of times people really struggle with this notion of, does God want to heal me? I'll talk about this a little bit in this upcoming message that I'm about to do, but um, anyway, if you want more from a biblical standpoint to buttress that, this will be helpful for you. And then the last thing, we've got 24 different series of cards. Uh, the main table is just here behind this wall, but there's a side table just over there. You can see it through those doors. Um, and on that side table, we have 24 different series of what appear to be credit cards, but they're not. They're all wrapped in cellophane, so in order to utilize it, you actually have to pull the cellophane off and you pull the, what looks to be the credit card out. Now, every, say, there's 24 different ones, and uh, each one has different messages on it. They're priced so that you're going to pay the same here as if you download it off our website. Um, sometimes people want to take something home with them. And if you want to know what's on each one, this the front will tell you what the topic is. This one says the kingdom of God part one. The back will tell you the title of the messages in the series so you know what you're buying. And from the front, it looks like nothing. From the back, you can see there's a little thing right there that doesn't exactly match. And that's because if you just gently push from the rear, it'll pivot out. And now you can plug it into the USB port on your computer and you can upload it to your computer. You could just play it directly off of the drive. You could port those messages to your phone or your tablet and take me everywhere. Um, I could become your constant companion. Anyway, um, these have become more popular. CDs and DVDs are kind of phasing out, but there's plenty of people who still have cars that play CDs and people like to listen uh, when they drive, so the CDs are useful for that. And the DVDs, of course, a lot of people want to watch them at home, play them in Sunday school, whatever. Um, so you can, you can go any route you want with all that. But anyway, uh, there we go. And can I recruit somebody to take these back out to the table and put them in their respective pile? Just match them to whatever the other ones are. Thank you. <clears throat> and as I say, we have other things out there as well, but those are all in, <clears throat> in one way or another related to what we're doing this weekend. All right, I want to talk in this session about when some are not healed. I mean, we like to talk about healing, get people excited about it, but to be a healing practitioner, you're going to be solving problems. Um, my friend Kai is somewhere around here. He might still be in the green room eating lunch, but he was with me in Armenia uh, just, you know, this last week. And we were talking about the things we run into with healing. And, uh, and I said, healing is a lot like a Rubik's Cube. You know there's a solution, but it might take you a while to figure it out. And, and that's really the way it is. So here's my fundamental approach to healing. And I wish I could claim original authorship of this, but I, I learned this from John Wimber. And the older I get and the more praying for people I do, the truer I find what I'm about to say to be true. So I hope you'll really catch this as I say it. Um, there is a solution in God to every healing problem that exists with this one exception. It's a category. It's not one particular type of healing. And that exception is when it's a sickness unto death. When it's a sickness unto death, you're going to die of the disease that you have. We have a passage in the book of 2 Kings. It's describing the end of the prophet Elisha and his, the end of his life. And it says that the prophet Elisha was sick with the disease of which he would die. And it doesn't say what that disease is. It just says he's going to die of that disease. And the scripture says that there is a sickness unto death I do not say that you should pray for that disease or that sickness. 
That's found in the New Testament. So the critical question obviously and rapidly becomes, is this particular thing that I'm dealing with, is it a sickness unto death or is it not a sickness unto death? And I think sometimes in the church we fall victim to the mentality of just praying a lot rather than praying unto breakthrough. Now, recently I was in Washington, D.C., and I give a, gave a teaching on the Lord of Breakthrough. David gave this name to God after a particular defeat that he had over the Philistines in the book of 2 Samuel chapter 5. You can look at it later. But David found breakthrough. And so with that, I want to introduce you to the notion that what we seek when we pray is not to pray a lot. I mean, it may take a lot, but that's not the goal. I would much rather pray short than long and see the same effect. So we are praying unto breakthrough. And when I said that to that crowd, a lot of them, they looked like I you know, slapped them across the face with a wet fish. Because they were just used to praying and praying and praying and praying, and they weren't getting anywhere. And I said, well, are you praying unto breakthrough? And how do you do that? Well, that's its own conversation. And that might mean something a little different in an intercessory context than in a healing context, but this is a healing conference, so we'll keep our remarks focused on that. But breakthrough is the issue, not to continue praying. And just as an example of that, um, there is a woman in Washington, D.C. I haven't seen her in a while now, but she used to come to my meetings there, and she came from a family with enough money that she had some mobility, and consequently, when I first prayed with her and she wasn't healed, she started stalking me, but not in a bad way. Not in a bad way. Um, she would contact me and say, well, you're going to be on the East Coast. You're going to be in whatever, Philadelphia or Boston or New York or maybe sometimes like Ohio or Indiana or something. I will fly there if you'll pray for me. And, you know, part of what I like to see is I like to see breakthrough. I like to see people healed. So I'm not interested in just praying to pray. And so with this particular woman, I said, yeah, okay, you can do that. And I was careful. I never prayed for her alone or in hotel rooms or anything like that. But, but the point was we would find a way to you know, meet up and we would pray. Now, this woman had a condition that it has a medical name. I don't know what it is. Matthew Suh, who is in the green room, he's a trained surgeon and he's now in the ministry Basically, I cost him more than a million dollars a year because uh, he was so impacted by the stuff we do that he gave up the practice of medicine to be a preacher and church planner. So anyway, um, I don't know if I feel good or bad about that, but anyway, it was the call of the Lord, not me. Um, he would know the name of that condition. On one occasion, I told this story, and he said, oh, that's called... But whatever it is, she had this thing where... She had cracks under her arms and in her groin, right here where the leg joins the trunk of the body. And the cracks were about this wide and about so long, and they continually oozed pus. And there, it was such a heavy flow of pus that she had to change the dressings about five times a day. And she'd been to all kinds of doctors, and nobody could figure out what to do with it. So the first time she came, she told me she had this condition, and I prayed with her, and she wasn't healed. And so the next time I went to Washington, she came again, and I prayed with her, and she wasn't healed. And then we got into this thing where she was you know, going to cities where I was going to be. And so I prayed for her on and off many times a year, and often for more than just a couple minutes. I mean, some of these were... You know, we would make time and, you know, I'd have my assistant or somebody join us and maybe we'd pray two hours or three hours. And I'm talking like six, seven, eight times a year. And uh, anyway, a little bit before COVID, I think it was in 2018, I was going to be in New York City and I, you know, got the expected by now message. Hey, I'll come to New York. Can you pray for me? And I said, sure, but in my heart, in my mind, I was thinking, I don't want to do this. I'm tired of praying. 
She's not getting healed, and I don't have anything else to give her. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. I'm really, I'm burned out on this. But I told her yes, because I, this is my commitment. Unless it's a sickness unto death, there is a, there's a solution in God. Now, if it's a sickness unto death, that's a different thing. They're going to die of that disease. But, you know, even people who have a sickness unto death, we've been remarkably graced by the Lord to see cancer patients die with no medication and no pain or whatever. Because everybody's going to die of something sometime. It's just what are you going to die of? And I think God's highest and best is that we not die of disease and sickness. But sometimes it happens. It's just, you know, I'm a realist and I know that it does go on, so it'd be foolish to say otherwise. But God's highest and best is that we die hale and healthy. Moses did. His strength was not diminished and his vigor was not abated. And he died at 120. So that's God's optimum, but, but sometimes we don't get there. All right, so back to this woman. So we, uh, we meet at my friend's apartment, woman friend, and this woman brings her roommate with her. So there's me and three women. So, you know, again, it's a good, safe, up and up kind of setting. And we sit down to pray. And I didn't say it aloud, but in my mind, I prayed and I said, God, I have no energy for this. I'm sick and tired of praying for this woman. It's been five years. She hasn't been healed. I've prayed every single thing you've ever taught me. I don't know what to do. Why will you not give me the answer to this healing? Because I know in you there is a healing for this situation. And as I sat down next to her, she was right here on my right. The, the woman who owned the apartment or rented it was there, and the roommate was across the table from us. And so here we are, and I put my hand on her shoulder, and the moment I touched her, the word of the Lord came to me, and he said to me, what is pus? It's, it's white blood cells. And? Uh, well, uh, and what? Well, what have I taught you about blood and issues of blood and the things that go with that and the diseases that arise from it? And then the penny dropped. Pus is white blood, but it's still blood. And the conditions that deal with general bleeding that we think of as red apply to bleeding that is white. And so now I was like, pee, range to target, 1724 meters. Target acquisition, come about to 183, fire. <laughs> and at that moment, she goes, I've just been healed. And I said, are you kidding? She said, no, I felt virtue go through me. And then she, she reaches up, pulls down her shirt, shows me her armpit, and it's completely closed. And I was like, wow, there it is. Five years. Five years. But we found breakthrough. I want to encourage you with that, but I also want to challenge you with that. Become more ornery. Become more stubborn. Do not give up. Her condition was not a condition unto death. It was by definition not a sickness unto death. Therefore, it had a solution in God. But nobody knew what it was until the word of the Lord came to me and it happened. Does that make sense? So it's really out of experiences like that, not, not that one specifically, but ones like that, <clears throat> that I want to talk to you about when some are not healed. And so when, when people don't get healed, there is a reason and our job, like solving a Rubik's Cube, is to figure out what in the heck is going on here. Now, that can be a drawn-out, difficult process. It only took me five years of figuring that one out. And maybe it was because I was, you know, hard of heart and dull of hearing. I mean, Jesus is always upbraiding his disciples for this in the Bible. I, I don't know why I would be any better than they are. I mean, I might want to think I am, but I know human nature well enough to know that maybe it's just that I wasn't listening when he was talking, or I didn't get it when he tried to tell me. And on that particular day, just as because I was so desperate and burned out that when I prayed, the Lord was like, uh, hello, McFly, I've been trying to talk to you, McFly. 
And so, boom, the answer came. Most of us have not been trained to anticipate in this way. And, you know, expectation is, is a critical component that underlies the healing ministry and this ability to contact the living power of God. That's what I want to talk about in the second half of this afternoon session, <clears throat> assuming that time allows us to do it. But um, the power of God is akin to electricity. It is not electricity. But it has aspects to it that seem electrical. And so it's akin to the electricity in this sense. It flows and it can be directed. And it's waiting to be released by those who follow him. When uh, Pete and Trish came here today, or maybe you have an advanced team that opens the building, somebody came in and flicked on the light switch and the lights went on and that's why we're not sitting here in a semi-dark room. There'd be a little bit of natural light coming in from the windows, but, but somebody had to turn on the lights. And so, um, you know, if we move into a home, into a, a place that we're going to live, we contact the power company and we ask them to turn on the power. And when we get there, as new residents, as we're moving in, we expect that the power will be working, um, but some rooms remain dark, maybe. And so we start figuring out why aren't the lights coming on in this room. And that's what I want to talk about when we say some are not healed. Now, as we think about healing that fails, uh, we have a couple of verses that come to mind. One is uh, Matthew chapter 10, verse 1. And in that passage, it says, And he called to him his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. Does your Bible say every? Every. Every. So every is an all-inclusive word. There are no exceptions to it, except maybe a sickness unto death. And by the way, there are instances in the Scripture where, for example, Hezekiah is told, set your house in order, you will die. Isaiah turns to leave the house. It says before he'd even walked out of the house. Now, it's probably a big house. It's a king's house. It's a palace. But before he'd gotten out of the house, it says before he'd crossed the middle court, so I guess there was some sort of a patio area or an atrium or something. It is a Mediterranean climate in Israel. Um, the word of the Lord came to him and said, go back and tell Hezekiah I've heard his prayer. I will add 15 years to his life. So there might even be times where a sickness unto death can be turned around. But that's not really my focus today, so I don't want to get, I don't want to get trapped there and dwell on that issue. I just throw it out there that even a sickness unto death may not always result in death. But if it's not a sickness unto death, if it's a blindness, if it's this, you know, cracks under the armpits, if it's, you know, headaches, it's whatever, broken bones and so on, somewhere, somehow, there is something in the will and mind of God that if we can find our way to that place, he will give us the answer and it will result in breakthrough healings. And I've got dozens and hundreds of stories like this. I just can't tell them all or we never get out of here today. But Jesus gave his authorities, uh, gave his disciples authority over unclean spirits and to heal every disease and every affliction. And then we find Mark 9, 17 and 18. In that story, Jesus has been on the Mount of Transfiguration and he's had Peter and James and John with him. And the other nine apostles have been left at the base of the mountain running the healing revival. I don't know if they had a tent or... They're just standing on a rock preaching. Who knows? But whatever. The nine are down there. And when Jesus returns from the transfiguration, a man says, Teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. So I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able. Wait a minute. What's going on here? Jesus gave them authority over every disease and every spirit, and yet they're failing at this fairly late date in Jesus' ministry. You know, he's going to go from the transfiguration straight through to Jerusalem where he's going to be betrayed and killed. So they've been on this journey already for at least two and a half years. 
watching him, being commissioned by him, empowered, equipped, and they have this failure, massive failure, epic failure. In fact, it's so bad, Jesus says, oh, you unbelieving generation. He's not referring to the dad. He's talking to the nine. He says, how long am I going to be with you? Don't you realize the clock's running out? I'm going to be out of here. When are you going to figure this out? And we don't usually think of Jesus being that intense, possibly angry, but if you read his words, there are times that he really chastises his own disciples for being like, well, the nine stooges, not the three, but the same idea. So they failed, and yet they had authority, and yet they'd been commissioned. This should not have failed. Jesus had an expectation of them. Don't fail. I remember one time I was with a friend of mine in Indonesia. And there was a woman in the congregation. She'd been deaf, I think it was 54 years. It was right around there. <clears throat> She'd lost her hearing on the day she gave her life to Jesus. And she was in the meeting and she came up and we prayed for her, my friend and I, and she was instantly healed of 54 years of deafness, or maybe it was 53. And I wouldn't have had the, I don't know, rashness might be the word, temerity. Some would say boldness. Pick whatever variant of that word you want to de, you know, define whatever level of intensity and disgust you want embedded in that word. But my friend turned to the entire congregation, which was around 1,000 people, and he said, what are you people doing? This woman's been in your church for 54 years, deaf. Why didn't you fix this? Well, we don't often preach that way in the West. And that's why I say, I don't know if I would have had the rashness or temerity or boldness to say that. But it does raise the question, what's going on here? If we've been given that authority, why aren't we solving the more problems? Does this make sense? I don't want anyone coming under condemnation. I'm just trying to blow the dust off of some of the shibboleths that we have going on religiously about these kinds of issues. Well, when Jesus sent out the 12 and later the 72, he gave them a commission, and that commission was clear. Heal the sick and raise the dead and drive out demons. He gave them dominion over demons and disease and sickness and death. And their mission, for the most part, had amazing and happy results. They, the 72 come back, and it says, Lord, wow, even the demons submit to us in your name. Woohoo! You know, they're, they're pretty lit up, right? And yet we have this one story where it failed. And so Jesus has to step in and deliver and heal the boy whom the apostles were unable to do, do this with. And so as with them, so also today, some are not healed at times. And the question is why? Well, I'm not going to be able to answer for every single last case, but I do want to give you a general working paradigm of how we think about this. And so there, there's a sad truth that often, and maybe far more often than we'd like to admit, some are not healed and nobody likes it. And we emphasize the goodness of God and the healing of God and we preach sermons on it. And in fact, this is because God is a healing God. That's not in doubt. He gives himself the name, the Lord your healer. In fact, it's the second revelatory name that he gave to Moses. The first one is I am who I am in Exodus 3, what is it, 14. And then he gives this other one in uh, Exodus 15, 26, I am the Lord your healer. <clears throat> but there are times when healing doesn't happen, or as with this woman in Washington, D.C., uh, doesn't happen quickly. A lot of times this is more true in places like America, maybe Australia, Western Europe, than it is in other countries. But no matter where you go, if you're in engaged in healing, you know there are times when it doesn't work so well. And yet, I've seen many meetings, I've led many meetings, where as near as we were able to determine, and we went to great extremes to verify what I'm about to say, 
100% of the people got 100% healed. Every single person who came, whatever they needed, they got healed. Cripples, blind, dumb, whatever, dyslexic, blood diseases, cancer, some of those we had to wait a little longer to get the confirmation, but we got it. 100 by 100 healing can be our reality. Again, it's, it's not every time, but it, it should be the goal that we're aiming for. You know, the old saying, you know, aim high, even if you're a little low, you'll be better off than if you aim, aim low and you're low of that. So I've had people, especially some pastors, get angry with me for stating this, but it doesn't change the truth of it. That we see meetings, even in the United States of America, not all the time, but we see them where 100% of the people get, as near as we can tell, 100% healed. Now, of course, this presupposes a few things. One of them is you'll stay and pray until everybody gets prayed for. Sometimes we can't do that or don't want to do that. Uh, it presupposes that we have been able to identify whatever the underlying issues are and that we get to that. We have some methodologies around that, that five steps to healing that I showed you. That will get you pretty far down the road with a lot of it, but, but there's more to teach than even what that message has. And then, of course, there's supernatural stuff where the Lord just gives you insight and you go after that thing that the Lord has shown you and it proves to be right. Um, but achieving that level of outcome means a kind of dedication to this that if, if your prayer model is two to five minutes at the altar and then we just say, well, must not be God's will today, that won't work so well. So this morning when we had our prayer time, I let that linger a bit. And, you know, I, fortunately, a lot of these were going relatively rapidly. But if you were paying attention, some of my prayer team spent 15 or 20 or 30 minutes with various people that they were contacting. I didn't do that so much, not because I don't value it, but because I know as the main speaker, people kind of want me to pray for them. And I was trying to get around to lay hands on people to be sure that they didn't feel they'd been overlooked. That was just a conscious choice I made. Uh, to do that, but, but this idea of lingering and tarrying is a really big deal. John Lake is a name that everybody who studies the healing ministry is aware of. Um, his sermons are amazing. His ministry has wowed people for a hundred years. But you know, the thing that many people miss about John Lake is that if you read his journals and his sermons, it's not rare to see something like this. Blah, 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 blah. We went to Brother Jones's house to pray. And he was sorely afflicted and in bed. And so I knelt by the bed. Blah, 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 blah. And we prayed. Six hours later, the lightnings of God went through me and Brother Jones was healed. Blah, 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 blah. And it's like six hours later. Wait, what? Who does that? And, you know, everybody thinks John Lake had the instantaneous boom. Not always the case. And so one of the things we've got to become better at is being patient, canceling our schedule, not feeling like we've constantly got to be on social media liking every post by whoever it is that we're following within five seconds of them posting it lest they think that we're not paying attention. We may have to give up watching television, including maybe Monday night football, so that we can spend that time with Brother Jones or Sister Jones. I mean, this, do you understand we're talking about discipleship here? This is a lifestyle choice now. Five years I prayed for this woman, probably eight-ish times a year, at two or, two or three hours a session. Do the math. I had over 100 hours invested in her. That's well over a week and a half of work time, if it were, you were measuring it as a work week, well over that. And finally, we got the breakthrough. We, we have reduced Christianity to a formula. Just decree and declare. Just make a prophetic proclamation. Be healed, be healed, be healed, be healed. Now, if the anointing's flowing in a big meeting and that's happening, you can do it and it'll work. But that's not all the time. And what do you do with the other part of the time? And what do you do if you're not on the platform? You're not that guy or that woman who's brought in to, you know, lead meetings like that. You might not ever experience be healed, be healed, be healed, be healed. And so I'm, 
I'm talking about you if you're not the platform person. So one of the reasons that some don't get healed is either the prayer recipient or the prayer minister doesn't believe that God wants to heal. Now, this can, be, this can have a range of exp expressions. At the worst, God stopped doing that when the last apostle died or when the canon closed. And Okay, we've all heard that one. Sometimes it's God doesn't want to heal here right now. It sucks to be you. You know, be warmed and filled. I'll see you later. That's another way that we get there. And so to answer this question, um, sometimes people theologize it. And theologizing can be a way of building what amount to intellectual arguments around why this isn't occurring. One of the common ones you'll hear people say is, God wants to teach me something. Of course, what that something is is rarely defined. You're just left suffering. Sometimes it's veiled in language about sovereignty. Uh, it might have a, a tone like this. God heals those whom he chooses. Therefore, we pray, Father, if it be thy will. A lot of you are moaning and groaning and shaking your heads. I assume because you've heard all of this, maybe been in churches where this is taught. And ultimately, this thinking gets passed on from one person to the next until it's codified as truth. But if Jesus is the perfect image of the Father, Colossians 1.15, and we know the Father's name is healing because he gave himself that name, Exodus 15.26, and if Jesus is the exact representation of his nature, Hebrews 1.3, and he is the same yesterday, today, and forever, meaning New Testament right now in 2022 and all the way until the end, if these things are all true, then it cannot be true that God is out of the healing business. It's just logically impossible. That's like saying, okay, back to my house illustration, I've got this house, whether I'm leasing it or I bought it, and I'm going to move into it, but the power company doesn't exist. Really? Isn't there a company out here called Con Edison? Now, it's, now what it's called? Con Edison. Okay. Well, maybe they didn't run wires to my house. My, my house is the exception. There's no electricity for my house. It's just everybody else in New Jersey can turn on their lights. It's the same type of analogy that people use. And yet the Bible tells us, Matthew 9, 35, Jesus healed all who came to him. Every single one of them got healed. So when I think about healing ministry, that's my reference standard. I'm not saying there aren't times it fails for me too. I'm just saying I'm always looking for that. That's my expected outcome. And if it isn't, I want to know why, what went wrong. So unless we're prepared to say that the Bible is wrong about the extent of Jesus' healing ministry, and there are some theologians who do that, um, particularly those of either a liberal or a dispensational theological bent. The liberals say it never happened, and the dispensationalists say it stopped happening. But either way, it ain't happening. And all of that's wrong. So maybe they want to argue that the nature and will of our unchanging God have changed. But that's a logical fallacy, too. If he's unchanging, then nothing's changed. So we should have confidence that God wants to heal. That kind of closes out point one. And I used about six scriptures to shoot holes in that. So we'll leave the corpse by the side of the road. All right, mistaken reason two, we believe that persuading God to heal can be difficult. And so some might say something like this. There are those, even in the Bible, who sought healing and it did not come easily. And when they do this, they're thinking of people like the Syrophoenician woman Jesus has this kind of back and forth dialogue with her. It's found in uh, the 15th chapter of Matthew and the 7th chapter of Mark. Just for brevity, I'm not reading the passage, or otherwise I would, but I'm just aware of our back end. But this Syrophoenician woman, she finds Jesus on vacation along the Lebanese coast. It says he'd gone into the region of Tyre and Sidon. 
And so she, she knows that he's around. She, somehow she'd heard about him. It says she's a Syrophoenician. That tells you she's, and Mark, Matthew makes it really clear, she's an unclean woman. She's a dirty dog, Greek speaking, one of them. Um, and so she comes and she hears that Jesus is in the area and he's gone on a beach vacation, apparently, um, with the 12 apostles and, you know, 13 men in a house. Don't even picture it, right? Nobody's going to want to cook breakfast. So in the way I kind of picture the story playing out, it's breakfast time and Jesus and the 12, they've gone out, they're walking down the boardwalk, they're going to somebody's seaside cafe where they're going to have, you know, fish and eggs because they sure aren't going to eat bacon and eggs. So they, they're going along the boardwalk and she sees them and she's like, hey, it's you. Yeah, you. <laughs> hey, yeah, yeah, I want to talk to you. And it says she came yelling after them. She's making a big commotion. Jesus, hey, you! And she's, she's doing that, and the disciples are like, would you tell her to shut up? Would you, just, would you just get this woman out of here? We're on vacation. This isn't the time, and especially not her. She's one of them. This is Greek society. She's a Syrophoenician. This is the Lebanese coast. She's probably wearing a string bikini. And Jesus is a rabbi. There's nothing that mentions her husband. She could have had this kid out of wedlock. We don't know. So this is a, you know, kind of a dicey situation. And, you know, Jesus has this back and forth with her. Well, I was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And she's, oh, Lord. She falls down and worships him. And then he says, it's not right to give what belongs to the children to dogs. Oh, yes, Lord, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the table. I may be a dog, but there's enough overflow in the kingdom of God that I should get some of that. And Jesus goes, woman, your faith is great. You can have what you ask for. Boom. Well, she had to contend for what she sought. But she got what she wanted. And let's be clear, it was always in the mind of God that women like this would get what they needed because the intention was to send the gospel to the nations. It was just maybe a year or two early. You know, once Pentecost came, the doors are open to everybody. But at that moment in time, it's not yet there. And yet she's basically saying, I want an advance payment on what will be my inheritance. Give it to me now. And she gets it. She's not even in the covenant for crying out loud. But you are. You are. And you are in the new and better covenant. The everlasting covenant sealed in his blood. So she's contending, but sometimes when people hear that word, they think they're trying to twist God's arm, trying to get him to do what he doesn't really want to do. I don't mean that at all. I mean that we go to the Lord in confidence based on his word and his character, which we know, and it's asking earnestly in accordance with the revealed will of God. That's what it is. The revealed will of God. Now, we have reason to know this is the revealed will of God. Again, back to Exodus 15, 26. He named himself the Lord, your healer. Do you think he means it? He gave us Isaiah 53. Surely he's borne our griefs and carried his sorrows, our sorrows. So whether it's inner healing and he's carrying away our sorrows and griefs, or it's physical healing, by his wounds we are healed. And if you were concerned that maybe that's an over-exegesis of Isaiah 53, just go look at Matthew and what he says in chapter 8, verse 21, where it says this happened to fulfill what was written by the prophet Isaiah, that he wore our griefs, carried our sorrows, and we are healed. So the New Testament clearly nails that down. You don't need to convince God about anything here. And yet a lot of people think they do. Sometimes they feel unworthy. Sometimes they're aware of things they've done and, you know, that guilt, shame, whatever, that's in their mind. There's a lot of reasons. But anyway, so when we contend, we're arguing from a place of victory. It's like a lawyer who's before a courtroom. And by the way, I'm not thereby saying we go to the courts of heaven. 
I'm just saying it's like a lawyer in a courtroom who makes his case based on settled legal precedent. This is what the law says, and what's going on here is contrary to the legal precedent. Therefore, this case should be handled in this way. And the judge says, you're right, bang, case dismissed or closed or whatever. So in the case of the Syrophoenician woman, she just came before the time when the gospel was sent to those outside of Israel. She was ahead of her time, but she got it anyway. Well, similar to her, when we come looking for healing, we know what the fullness of time will bring. We know when the final revelation of Jesus comes, when the kingdom is fulfilled, all we're asking for is, Lord, let the powers of the coming age be revealed now. And if she got a well done, your faith is great, why shouldn't we? All right, a third reason that it sometimes fails is we don't understand that salvation and healing are actually linked. <clears throat> so let's answer the question of why some are not healed with another question. 1 Timothy 2.4 says God wants all women and men to be saved. Most of our translations just say men, but I'm trying to be inclusive. God wants everybody to be saved, but not everybody gets saved. Does that mean God's will isn't God's will? No. Does it mean that God can't deliver the goods? No. It means there's a problem down here on the earth, not up there in the heaven. Similarly with healing, again, as long as it's not a sickness unto death, if there's a problem, it's down here somewhere. It's not with God. So, just as with salvation, if some reject the gospel and are not saved, why should we pray for those whom we love to be saved? Shouldn't we just let God's will run its course? If that's the logic that we're using if we're, thinking about, uh, if we're thinking about healing. Yep, we'll just see what God does. Whatever you will, Lord. Well, when it comes to the matter of salvation, we see the matter clearly. And as a result, you know, we go on fasts. We pray and, you know, spend all night in the church or by our bed praying for our children or our husband or our wife or whatever it may be and asking with the idea, we even say, Lord, you say you want all to be saved. Bring my loved one to you. Don't we do that? Well, should we not also do that with healing? Now, in the end, yeah, some are going to reject the gospel um, and somehow thus the will of God that all be saved is thwarted. It's not that God couldn't override it. It's that in general, nearly nearly universally, he leaves people to their own devices. He does give us free will. This is one of the great mysteries of humanity that the Lord would allow us this. But in fact, he does. There are a few exceptions. Paul the Apostle is a noteworthy one. He's on his way to kill Christians and he's you know, met on the Damascus Road, struck from his horse, blinded. That'll get your attention. But we don't see many of those. So I think to expect that is probably going a bit too far. So this worldly elements are the things that thwart healing. Now salvation and healing are interrelated. I mentioned Isaiah 53 a few moments ago. Um, I talk about that, that passage in great depth, unpacking the Hebrew. Uh, in that one series I held up, God's will is to heal. So maybe that alone is worth the price of admission. But Isaiah says, by his wounds we are healed. That's Isaiah 53, 5. And Matthew grounds the healing ministry of Jesus in it. I mentioned that a moment ago. So while Jesus healed to confirm the reality of the kingdom, without the healing king, there would be no kingdom. So Isaiah 53 isn't a misplaced Pentecostal theological emphasis. It's a solidly kingdom passage. And it tells us that... Um, Sometimes things have to fall into alignment correctly. Isaiah 53 wouldn't work until Jesus was born. Think about that one. Here's a promise in the word that needed 700 years to be fulfilled. Fortunately, we don't have to wait that long. So salvation and healing aren't the same, but they're related. And I mentioned this earlier. The Greek word sozo is an all-inclusive word. And we might say sozo is the Greek equivalent of to come under the shalom of God, the balance, the order, the restoration of all that God 
really wants to have. So when I say sozo, I don't mean the ministry techniques called sozo. But when we think about sozo as shalom, we understand that we've been saved into a big salvation. And so God's transformative power can affect every sphere of life. That's kind of what we were talking about in the first session. So if we're confident that God wants to save people, then we should be confident that he wants to heal people. And so with this understanding, let's go back to our first question, why aren't all healed? When healing doesn't come, it's because something on earth is blocking the healing, as I just said. Human choices can block healing. Earthly factors can block healing. Going back to the idea of a home and the electricity company, sometimes the power company has turned on the electricity, but rooms remain lit. So let's unpack diagnosing that house. Sometimes the power was never turned on. Maybe Con Ed didn't get the order, or it got misplaced, or they put the wrong date on it, and you know, two days after you move in is what they thought to turn on the power, and so the power's not there. Now and then that does happen. If you don't know the power of the Holy Spirit, if there's no electricity running to the house, well, then the house is going to remain dark. Jesus even said, Acts 1.8, remain in Jerusalem until you are filled with the Holy Spirit, until you are clothed, mantled with power from on high. It is foolish to try to do the work of the Spirit in the flesh. It will not work. Flesh gives birth to flesh. Spirit gives birth to spirit. Jesus taught this. And so, you know, if, if you aren't seeing people get healed, you might ask yourself, have I been filled with the Spirit? I mean, it seems like a deceptively simple question, but there are times that that's really a thing. So that could be a reason, and a related reason, but not the same one, is am I doing things in my life as a prayer minister that quench the flow of the Spirit of God? If you've got things hidden in your heart, you know, Isaiah in the 50s, particularly chapter 55, he talks about how your sins have made a separation between you and God so that he does not hear your prayers. If you're a prayer minister and you've got some sort of unconfessed, unresolved issue in your life and you think you're just going to sweep it under the rug and pretend, you might do okay showing up at church and acting religious, but when it comes time to pray for the sick or drive out demons, this is going to sort the men from the boys. So, church, it's time to get holy. Yeah. I'm not saying that... I, I don't want to create this kind of schmarmy religiosity, but again, we live in a lawless time where people think they can do any old thing they want and because God loves me the same either way, and so there's nothing I can do to change that, and he's my papa, and so it's cool. That's lawlessness. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, so that... Maybe the power wasn't turned on, and we talk now about that. So the second reason could be maybe the power's turned on, but the electrical panel has some circuits turned off. Now, what does that look like? Well, sometimes people have theology that experience, keeps them from experiencing God the way God wants them to experience him. You know, it's interesting. All of the early theology in the church was prayed theology. It was experienced theology. One of my seminary professors, you know, it's been a long time since I went to seminary. I don't remember too many gold nuggets from lectures, but there are a few nuggets. And one of them was one of my professors said, in the early church, all theology was prayed theology. The things that they taught were the things they lived. Yeah. Today, we teach things that come out of our head. It seems good. It's a theory, but it isn't actually something that we've sorted through, parsed, and settled on. It's like, this works. So people could have been told that these kinds of ministry experiences belong to the time of the apostles or to the time before the Bible was completed, or maybe it's reserved today only for particularly holy people like saints if you're in the Catholic or Orthodox traditions or pastors if you're in the evangelical church tradition. Maybe in our charismatic circles we say, well, you know, that happens more for apostles and prophets that's our own version of the same thing in the renewal stream, but it's the same problem. And so um, there may be other times where maybe people say, well, that room's off limits. Sure, we leased the house. Sure, we bought the house, but we can't go in that room. Well, why not? I mean, it's, it's our house. No, no, you just can't go in that room. Don't talk to me about that room. 
and it's not often that a Christian will say this explicitly, but it does happen, and they mentally and emotionally close off to such an encounter. Do not as underestimate the latent power of the soul. Watchman Nee wrote a book called The Latent Power of the Soul. I'm not wild about everything Watchman Nee said, but he was really on to something with that. And there are people for whom their theological grid, their mindset, the stuff they've been programmed with up here or down here, what is it that grips their affections? Or maybe tells them, don't get too wild and emotional around that God stuff. That's for religious fanatics. As soon as you hear that, that's a chilling kind of remark. I know one church that I, I used to go to um, down in the deep south, and they... Uh, they were known in their church network as those chandelier swingers because people had emotional encounters with God and all the rest of them were going, oh, that's, we're not going to do that. You get around that enough, it, it, it rubs off on you. It's, it's like, you know, shaming or something, right? And so the, the power of the mind, the power of the, the emotions, this is the latent power of the soul. And don't underestimate its power to block people from encounters with God. I mean, my friend Steve, I mentioned him in this morning when we were talking at breakfast today. You said earlier on in your Christian experience, the, the, the grid that you were given of God, that he was judgmental and looking to zap you and judge you and all that, it kept you from encountering God until that all got addressed. And a lot of people carry that because of the kind of defective theology and poor pastoring that they've been subjected to through for much of their life. I remember one time I did a meeting close to my home, and let me tell you, this is as rare as a purple squirrel. I just don't get a lot of invitations in my own hometown, but I did have this one, and it was just down the street from me. And so I, I went and did this meeting, and a bunch of people showed up. And uh, at the end of the meeting, a woman walks up to me and she says, hey, uh, my mom's really in a bad way. And I was wondering, could you come by the house and pray for her? She doesn't get out much. And I was like, Jesus, do I do this or not? Because I don't make too many house calls when I'm home. I travel enough. I try to give all my time at home to my wife and, and my daughter. The other two daughters are gone, so it's hard to give time to them. They're, they live in other states now. But this one daughter still lives with us. And I, it was just a nudge. I wouldn't say it was a clear word from God, but I felt a nudge. Yeah, you should go do it. Turned out this woman lived five minutes from where I live, so it was a really easy house call to make. So, you know, I go over there, and I walk in, and here sits her mother, and she's in a chair. And you could take one look at her, and you're like, oh, nice to meet you and all 300 of your closest friends. So... I start talking with her about healing and, you know, the problems that she's got. And somewhere in all that, I said, well, you know, the kinds of things you're describing to me, these commonly arise in people who have either been physically abused or sexually abused. Um, I said, I know you've only met me and you really have no reason to trust me, but your daughter thought enough of me to have me over. So can I ask you, has either of these things ever happened to you? And her mother looks at her daughter, and if looks could kill, the daughter would have been hung, quartered, and the pieces would have been, you know, burned in the fire. I mean, it was, it was, mom did not want to have this information being talked about. And the daughter looks at her and she goes, but mom, don't you remember the stories you used to tell me about that bad man who hung around with dad? And her mother just looked at her. And I said, you know, this is obviously a little bit of a tense situation. I'll just step outside. You guys talk about this for a bit. And then you can, once you work this out, you can let me know what you want to do. I'll just wait. So I excused myself and I walked out the front door and I just stood in the front yard. I mean, I figured if this goes south, I've only got five minutes to get home. <laughs> right. So it, it was about 20 minutes. They left me out there. And finally, the daughter comes out and she goes, um, my mom doesn't want to do this. And I said, I kind of suspected that. And so, you know, she brings me back in and I said, look, um, you know, here's my credentials in case you're wondering why you should listen to me, but I don't think I'm the right person to help you. I can give you some referrals to people that you might trust because they're tied to churches 
or they have degrees or whatever, that might be a better avenue for you than for me. But just, you know, nice to meet you. Be warmed and filled. I didn't say that. Uh, and so I left. Well, this happens from time to time. You're in ministry with somebody and it's on. The power's flowing, but you get to that point and the person goes, ain't going to go there. Uh-uh. No, not going to talk about that. That's why some are not healed. And so presupposed in everything that we teach and pray is that you have somebody who's willing to go to whatever length is needed. Last night in Fort Lee, we had a guy who was willing to come up on the stage in front of a crowd bigger even than this one uh, to receive prayer for his drug addiction to um, marijuana and Oxycontin and the fact that he was molested when he was young by a female relative. And we prayed him through that in front of an entire room full of people. We don't commonly do that with people. We try to guard their privacy. But this guy was so desperate to get free, he was like, I don't care. I'll talk about anything. And so he did. And everyone in the room was like, but you know what? In front of their eyes, they got healed. How many people were there last night and watched that? All right, so enough of you that you know I'm not making it up. Well, that guy wasn't playing the game of don't go in that room. Oh, no. So people can block the power of God. It's not that God can't overwhelm a person, break into those areas. It's that God normally doesn't do that because, as Revelation 3.20 says, Jesus stands at the door and knocks. Not often does he come with a battering ram. And people say, well, God, if you really want that door open, you just batter it down. Usually he's not going to answer that because it's a way of testing him. And the scripture says don't test God. But every now and then he'll listen to it and he'll come with a battering ram and then they get all hot and bothered and angry because why did God do that? It's like you asked for it. This is a relationship. Does this make sense? All right. So here's another reason. So that was two. The electrical panel has circuits turned off. Third reason is the wiring was never installed correctly. Or maybe sub-factor. It was installed correctly, but it's become corroded over time. It's been a while. Or maybe there's rodents in there, you know, nibbling away at it. But the bottom line is, in that case, the power isn't flowing to the room. It was intended to, but the wiring's no good. And so there can be people who are filled with the Spirit but they don't know they have power and authority, as we read in Matthew 10. Other times the prayer recipient may have things that are going on that have caused the wiring to become corroded. Now, again, in renewal stream Christianity, and particularly with our emphasis on grace, we don't very often speak of the causal factor of sin being something that can block healing. And I know why. John Wimber didn't like it when people talked about the sin roots of healing and yet privately when he would minister to people he would do it with as needed a reasonable degree of regularity as needed but publicly he didn't talk about it very much because all of us have probably been in those situations especially in certain kinds of charismatic churches that emerged in the late 60s and the 70s where it was like brother the reason you're not healed is you're in sin the Lord shows me that you're a wicked, wretched sinner. And then they walk away. And it's like, no, don't do that. Don't drop a load of bricks on your brother's head. If he's in sin, help him. That's what the Bible says we should do. First John 5. But people like to act very prophetic. The Lord shows by vision that you are, yea, verily, and forsooth, a wicked sinner, condemned to the seventh level of hell, because thou wilt not repent of that thing. Now, I'm being a little bit tongue-in-cheek here. But we've all, how many of you have seen situations like that where someone, yeah. So we, we want to stay pretty clear of that. But look, we can't deny the reality that in Luke 5, there is a man brought in by his friends. He's paralyzed. And the first thing Jesus said to him is, son, your sins are forgiven. I don't think Jesus wasted words. We want to make that in evangelicaldom, oh, yeah, Jesus was just showing that 
He was the son of God because no one can forgive sins but God. And so this is a proof of his divinity. Well, that might be true, but that's not what's going on in that passage. Jesus is saying, if you want to be healed, we've got to deal with that sin thing that's going on in you. And once we get rid of that thing, something's going to happen. And it does. The man rises and walks. So there are sin roots that can cause people not to be healed. And oftentimes those roots are things that they fall into three categories. The first one is they know it's there, but they don't talk about it because it's embarrassing. The second one is they know it's there, they could have forgotten about it, but they don't talk about it because it seems irrelevant. I didn't know it was a thing, as we say. And there are plenty of people who don't know the Bible well enough to know that, you know, that thing that you didn't think was a thing, God says that's a thing. What's this? Yeah, a Ouija board would be a really good example. There, there could be other, you know, items in that type of category. I remember one time, Steve, were you with me when we went to the Brinjelli Vineyard? No, okay. One time I was in Sydney, Australia. I went to this church. There was a young woman there, massive eating disorders, all kinds of problems in her body. From memory, maybe 26 years old. She and her mother both needed ministry. I asked them a bunch of questions. We were running out of time. I had to go to the airport. So we just left it and I went home. I don't do a lot of prayer for people over Zoom and Skype, mainly because if I do, I would not have a life. I just had to draw the line somewhere. So when I'm home, I pretty much refuse to do it. But now and then I need to finish out something that I've been engaged with and I want to, you know, I want to do it right. So I will follow it up. So anyway, the pastor says to me, would you please meet with this young woman again? I mean, we just, she is in such bad shape. And, you know, she's so despairing and blah, blah, blah. All right, fine, I'll do it when I get home. So a few days later, we meet on, back then we didn't have Zoom, it was Skype. And I'd asked her when I was with her, hey, do you, do you have anything having to do with, like, other religions or anything new age in your life? No, no, I don't have any of that. Okay. So we get on the Skype link, and we're, she's in her home. Her mom's sitting there on the couch with her. And psh, as soon as the picture comes up, on the back wall is a yin and a yang symbol. You know what that is? Okay, so we got a yin and a yang hanging on the wall. There's a multi-handed Hindu goddess on the bookcase behind her, and I can see clearly because of the angle of the camera and the distance to the bookshelf, I can see she's got, you know, like the rise of the I Ching and you know, all these kind of books like that. And I'm thinking, but as Father McCabe used to say, Jesus, Mary, Joseph, and all the saints. That's what I was thinking. So I said, I thought you told me you didn't do any of that stuff. She goes, what stuff? I said, that, that yin and yang and that Hindu goddess and all those books there. She goes, well, I'm a massage therapist. My clients expect it of me. I said, well, you got two choices. Either disinform your clients or find a new line of work. But you got to get rid of all that stuff. Well, ah, now it really began. She gets all huffy, and the mom kind of interrupts, and she goes, I'll take care of this. She goes, is there anything else you want to ask? I said, what about Freemasonry in the family? She goes, yeah, yeah, I've got Freemasonry. And I said, well, then your daughter's got Freemasonry too. The mom wasn't into all the Eastern religion stuff, so I pray for the mom for Freemasonry, and she ends up vomiting in a trash can, gets healed over the Zoom link. End of story. Well, the daughter watched all this happen, so... You know, we sign off. About a week later, I get a message saying, okay, my daughter and I have gone through the house. We got a dumpster from the trash company and threw out that much stuff out of her living quarters. And I'm like, yep. So we get on the next Skype session. We get after it. This woman gets totally healed. Well, so these kinds of things are real. And it illustrates this point well. The third reason that people may not get healed, so we said they know about it, but they're not talking about it because it's shameful. Uh, maybe they do know about it, or possibly they forgot about it, but either way, it didn't seem relevant at the time. They didn't get it. The third reason would be there may be a generational iniquity issue that is tied to their bloodline. I actually did a whole almost two-hour message on that when I was last here a while back, 
at the old building. So I'm not going to mention it at all here. You can just go find that teaching, or if you can't, I have it for sale on the table. You could buy it today and listen through it. But generational iniquity can be a third reason that, that that's in play. And by the way, any of these three things that I just mentioned could be a reason for the all-too-common phenomenon of I got healed at the healing meeting, but then I lost the healing on the way home or the next morning or a week later, whatever. Something wasn't thoroughly addressed. So this is not something I've ever really used to teach this concept before. But when I was in Armenia a week and a half ago, I was thinking, Jesus, how am I going to talk about these kinds of things with a translator who takes 50% longer than I do to say anything? I need something that I can use to teach these people rapidly. And it just came to me. It was a word of wisdom. It really was. I, I wish I could say I'm this clever, but the Lord spoke to me, and he said, talk to them about root canals. And I immediately got it. So there are some times you go to the dentist, and the dentist is pressing on your tooth with that pick thing, and he goes, oh, here's a soft spot here. We need to, we need to give you a filling. You may not even need any anesthesia. Here, hold on. And they clean out that thing. It's just on the surface and maybe they need to give you a little anesthesia if it's slightly deeper, but not much is involved. They seal it up with whatever they're using these days, ceramic or porcelain or something, and uh, you go home. All right, end of story. Some healings are like that. But sometimes you go in and he goes, hmm, mm. And when you hear that, you go, uh-oh, <laughs> just like he said. Ah, you know that molar back there? It's been bothering you, and that you know, thing that goes up into your head with pain? Yeah, well, your problem is you need a root canal. And, you know, those back teeth typically have three or four roots. What are your roots? Sin issues, soul issues, inner healing, wounding, emotional bondage, stuff like that, demonic stuff. There's a couple of other categories. But So then what do they do? After they put the Novocaine in you. And then comes out that big, long wire, and they're like, and what are they doing? I got to check the depth. I want to make sure I got it all. Why? Because if I don't, it's going to abscess. And you'll be worse off than when you started. And that's how healing works. And some healings need the equivalent of a root canal. And we're not doing root canals. We're just be healed in Jesus' name. Does this make sense? Okay. So... Our grace uh, that God gives us is great enough to overcome all of these things. But when we fix the wiring, God provided a way for that. And now, hopefully, this room can be lit. Just flick the switch. But, you know, we're doing some heavier work. Why? Well, to fix the wiring, you might have to open the wall. You might have to change the switch that, you know, is there. I mean, who knows? It just kind of depends on what the problem is. You might have to rewire the house, that brand new house that you just bought. And you're like, those, they, I paid 20000 too much, and I got the electrician out here, right? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> All right, here's a fourth reason. Okay, we're, we're going from the very general power company, light panel. You know, we're in the room now. Okay, next one is maybe we just never turned on the light switch. Some don't realize they have a role to play by using, as a prayer minister, the authority they've been given to let the power flow. Or, going back to our illustration of a house, um, you don't realize you've got to turn on the lights, and you actually do have the right to do that once you're the leaseholder or the, or the property owner. That's authority. Now, this pitfall is most common among people who are seeking to bring healing to others rather than those who are seeking healing for themselves. But on the other hand, there are some who seek healing who don't realize they need to reach out in faith to turn on the light switch to grasp what God has provided. And so there may be times in all of that where they say, maybe not exactly this way, but the content is, the, the idea behind it is, is the same. They say, it can't be as easy as turning on a light switch. And actually, it is that easy, because in the story of the centurion, who also should not have gotten what he asked for, because he was a Latin-speaking Roman centurion, not a Jewish man, who had a servant at home, 
He comes to Jesus. He says, would you please come to my house and pray for me? And Jesus says, I'll do it. Now, that in itself is extraordinary because a Jew would not go into a Gentile's house. It was unclean by definition. But Jesus is willing to go that far to do it. And as they're about to go, the centurion goes, you know, you don't even have to do that. Just say the word. I'm a, I'm a military commander. I know what it is to give an order and expect it to be followed. You give the order, it'll be followed. Jesus goes, man, I haven't found faith like this in Israel. I haven't found faith like this in the church either. But you know, it's funny. When I was in Armenia last week, I was preaching in this one meeting. And at the end of the meeting, this man walks up. And I had, you know, I had a translator with me the whole time. And he, blah, 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 in, in Armenian. And the translator says, he's come up to you because he said the Lord told him, if you put your hand on him, he will be healed. Okay, I put my hand on him. Be healed in Jesus' name. I said, how'd it go? She goes, he says he's healed. Show, ha, tell him to show me. Whatever it is that's wrong, I want to see it. So, you know, he starts doing this thing, and he's jumping up and down. He says he couldn't do that this morning, and his wife is sitting there doing like this. I'm like, okay, it worked. There are times when you will see that kind of great faith. I wouldn't say that's my norm, but it's an interesting story that illustrates this. And so the nature of um, regular repetition of anything is that it can become shop-worn and routine, and that inevitably stops the flow of faith, which by its nature is confident and expectant. So be careful to stay away from becoming shop-worn and routine. Okay, our last stop on this. So we've gone from the power company to the light panel to the room itself with, you know, the switches and the wiring and all that. And now we've actually turned it on and it's still not working. So maybe the light bulb in the lamp is burned out. And this is a picture of those who have become hardened, whether through sin or discouragement. Those aren't the same thing. Sin is one thing, wrongdoing, whether willful or, or unknown. You didn't realize you were doing wrong. Both are wrong. Or ju you're just flat out discouraged. You're burned out. Kind of like I was with the girl in New York, the woman in New York, after five years. But we did finally get the light <laughs> to go on. So in the case of sin, the writer to the Hebrews addresses this. He says, take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God, but exhort one another every day as long as it is called today that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Sin will have that effect on you. In fact, here's a truth that I learned a long time ago. Truth that is not accepted and implemented automatically hardens the heart. So if you've ever been sitting under teaching, I don't care, it could be Pete and Tricia, it could be Chuck Pierce, I mean, you've got a lot of Hall of Fame people, you know, in your green room back there. They come through this church. This is a church that is really trying to grab hold of all that God is doing. But from time to time, these people come and you're like, mm, I don't know about that. Uh-oh. <laughs> That's right. You beat me to it. Uh-oh. You might just have hardened your heart a bit. And if that happens 20 or 30 times, if you do it often, now you're in a really bad case. In the case of discouragement, again, this is a slightly different issue than hardening of heart. Paul the Apostle wrote, and let us not grow weary, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So if I hadn't prayed for that woman in New York City, well, she's from Washington, but it happened in New York City, on that particular day when I really didn't even want to go to the prayer appointment with her, she might still be in her condition today. I just had to push through my discouragement and God met me in that moment. So discouragement can kill faith as rapidly as unbelief can. Well, we could expand this list, but this is supposed to be a one-shot message, and we are trying to get out of here at some point today. So this brief discussion shows us the many different things that we need to be thinking about as we diagnose a healing problem, solving the Rubik's Cube. What didn't work? What went on? And so the net result is that in many instances when some are not healed, there are actually real and addressable situations, conditions in people's lives, which if we will address them, they can be healed. Healing can be complex. I know that quite well. And it involves more than an acquiescence or passive acceptance of some theological truth. And it also involves more than the recitation of formulas. 
One of the things that's going on in charismatic Christendom these days is a lot of formulas are being spun out, whether on webinars or wherever, and it's like if you just do this thing, pray this way, follow the formula, and boy, you better stay to the formula, buddy, because if you don't, you're going to be out of luck. That kind of thinking is, is entirely foreign to the thinking of the New Testament. But as we can also see, running a proper diagnostic, as we did thinking about a house, running the power from the power company to the power panel into the room, down to the switch, and ultimately to the lamp and the light bulb. Um, running proper diagnostics helps us in fixing electrical problems, and it also helps in bringing healing to those in need as well. One of the reasons people like to come and get healing from me and my teams is we talk about these kinds of things pretty regularly. And, you know, you do this after a while, you get pretty good at it. You know when you've got somebody who's been an electrician for one year who comes out to your house, and you know when you've got that guy and, you know, he's, he's got the old beat-up truck, and you look at him, you're like, man, you look like you're about ready to retire. But he just kind of looks around, he goes, yeah, your problem's right here. And that's what people are looking for. They're looking for that quick and accurate diagnostic. I think that's a lot of what Jesus did. Now, he, he had an advantage. He was sinless. Um, but he was teaching this to his disciples, and we see glimpses of it in their ministry style. We see a man born blind in John chapter 9, and they're looking at him, and they're like, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? Why would they ask a question like that? Because they had been trained to be diagnosticians. And how do we diagnose? By the word of God. We have to know the word of God. There are more principles in, on healing than I could possibly do in one afternoon. I'm just giving you a taste, a sampling of what this looks like. But in the scriptures, there are whole passages that... People kind of look at them like, I don't even know what this means. But, you know, when I start to unpack them, the people are like, wow. And then we have a healing time. And I'm thinking of one passage out of the book of Isaiah. I'm not going to teach on it. Sorry to ta uh, taunt you. But uh, this one passage out of Isaiah, most people don't even know what to do with it. Theologians are confused by it. Christians skip it over because it doesn't mean anything to them. And the Lord gave us some insight out of that one passage and it's become a breakthrough uh, healing concept for a particular class of healings that people need. I, I went to one church before COVID in Australia, and it was a you know, fairly large meeting we held. I taught on this, and at the end of it, you could just see people, they were just... So I said, now we're going to have a ministry time. The ministry time lasted four hours. And we had over 250 confirmed healings out of that one theological concept from the Word of God. So G we have it on the table. It's called memorials. So Jesus was doing this using the lens of Scripture, and he was bringing people back to something that had been long forgotten. I really believe the answers to most of the problems we have are found in the Word of God. I'm not trying to create a false juxtaposition with medicine or you know good psychological care or whatever but I'm just saying God knows what we need and long before anyone had invented modern medicine or modern psychology God was still taking care of his people but if we don't read the Bible correctly if we don't heed it correctly how in the world are we going to know these breakthrough concepts that are embedded right there in the scripture all right, well, we've talked about the problem of death, so we don't need to say uh, too much more about that other than, yeah, everybody's going to die. But I, I just want to say this. I want to go back to this idea of a glorious home going. As I said, Moses died in good health with his strength unabated and his eye undimmed. Deuteronomy 34, 7. F.F. F. Bosworth was a close associate of John Lake's. They ministered together in the 1920s, about 100 years ago. Um, later, they parted ways and each went off and did his own ministry. They didn't have a falling out. They just, you know, logical end of whatever they'd been doing. Both of them had been involved in the Azusa Street Revival. If you've never read F.F. F. Bosworth, the one book you really should get and read is called Christ the Healer. And he, uh, you know, he, he was a great healing evangelist with many, many documented healings to his name. Um, he, was, he was at the end of life and he was weakening and word of his imminent passing had spread among his close associates 
And so, you know, great ministers of that era were coming from all over the world to say their farewells and goodbyes. And, you know, he's, he's in his house and uh, he, was, he was in his bed. And <clears throat> on this particular day, quite a few of the great ministers of that era were gathered around the bed with him. And he was, he was at the point of going and suddenly he opened his eyes widely and sat bolt upright in bed. And he said, I see him. And of course he meant Jesus. And he said, I see them. And he meant the great cloud of witnesses. And then he said, glory to God. Don't weep for me. Hallelujah, I'm going home. And with that, he gave up the ghost and was gone. That's a glorious home going. That's where we want to be aiming for. Well, we all know there are times when the biblical ideal is not fully realized. Some seem to die peacefully and painlessly and others not so much. This is all due to the fall of, of our race, mankind. And because of sin, there is sickness in the world. And until... Sin is fully eradicated. Sickness will be with us. But I'm reminded of one of the, the um, affirmations of John Lake. He said, I will not cease to strive against sin and its effects in mankind as long as sin endures. And I will seek to lift mankind to the same exalted state that I have been able to see in their lifetime." So there will come a day when sickness is no more, but that day is not yet. Jesus said, pray for the kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Well, remember this. When some are not healed, it is a setback. It's not a defeat. So going from the end to the, to the beginning, check the light bulbs, the light switch, the wiring and the circuit panel. Be sure to call the power company for power. And let us continue to press in, seeking God for more and greater manifestations of healing. Faithful is he who called you, and he will do it. Amen. Amen. Let's take a short break. I know that there may be needs to uh, get some relief in the other green room. Uh, but let's not take long, because our goal was to end by 4.30. I want to talk a little bit about power, just a little bit more about that, and then we're going to have a healing time. Um, so it says 3.34 on that clock. Let's try to be back here by 3.45. Uh, that'll give you 11 minutes.
<laughs> All right. I want to talk briefly. I've got this whole message that, depending on where I am and how I do it, it, it can be an hour and a half message. But I, trust me, I won't do an hour and a half. But I want to talk about one of the most important concepts in the healing ministry. And I made mention of it in the last message, and it has to do with this matter of the power of God. The power of God, as I said, is akin to electricity, but it's not electricity. But it can be, as it were, conducted, and um, it is, it's a critical component. In fact, I'm going to go stronger than that. I think it's the necessary condition for healing. Yes. Now, there can be times that the word of the Lord will bring about healing. The word of faith movement is very strong on this idea. But unfortunately, a lot of the things that go on in that movement, um, basically they reduce the, the word of the Lord to, um, to a formula. So you have, to, you have to claim your healing in this way. And you stand on your confession until it is manifested. And of course, all of the people in this room would have had some familiarity with that. It's not that, there's, that that's altogether wrong, it's just that it's usually wrong. There is a kind of kinesis in the Word of God. The Word of God, the Scripture says, is living and active, and it is sharper than a two-edged sword, and it can divide asunder soul from spirit, and consequently it is, it is a factor in healing. But the way I think it really works, uh, somebody just asked me about this just as we were about to begin again, um, the way this really works, I think, is there are these moments in time, and they're discrete moments in time, in which a word is given and the word itself has power, and it is, it's related to the gifts of faith and miracles as described in 1 Corinthians 12, and that which is spoken, not decreed, spoken, because it has a gift of faith behind it, it has a kinetic power releases something and that which you say actually happens i've seen this on different occasions sometimes at close range i'm praying for someone and i'll say there it is right there receive that um, i had one time this is some years ago but i was in southern georgia and uh, i had a word for somebody with scoliosis and i called it out and there was a man sitting in the back over in the, the equivalent of that section there and I said, sir, come forward. And he came out of his seat, walked into the center aisle, and he was walking to the front. And I looked at him, and I saw in the spirit, the, the spirit of God falling on the man. And I said, the Lord heals you right now. Receive your healing. Just like that. And when I did, he started bouncing like this with his foot kind of stretched out. And he went, boom, I'm healed, I'm healed, I'm healed. And woo, he started running up and back. And I said, come here, I want to check your spine. And it was you know, as straight as you would, I'm not a doctor, but there was nothing defining curvature. There was no hump. There was no S shape. Everything seemed to be okay. So in that sense, the word can be kinetic. But a lot of times people fall into these formulas. I mentioned with the vineyard movement that, <clears throat> you know, John Wimber had this five-step model. I think it's a pretty robust model when used correctly. But most people in the vineyard today don't even know the five-step model, and if they do, they're very wooden about it. They just kind of, you know, march through it and, you know, grinding to the conclusion. They don't, they're, what I said earlier, they, they're praying to pray. They're not praying unto breakthrough. And so, you know, the vineyard has fallen into its own version of this. The word of faith camp has fallen into their own form. Well, you just got to stand on that proclamation. Yeah, but what if it had no anointing on it to begin with? Does it make sense? So this dynamic of power is a really important one. And so, again, I'm just going to give you a few choice cuts from the sirloins and back straps of, uh, of this cow. But one of the key distinctions of the present move of God is the power of God. And yet, it's unevenly distributed. You don't see it the same in every place. There are some parts of, the, you know, the faith renewal, uh, fourth wave, charismatic camp, where power is on evidence. You saw some of it this morning in the prayer time. And there are other places where there's not so much. 
And I think one of the key risks to the current outpouring is an emphasis on that formulaic mental way of, us, of going after that power versus the experienced dynamic power. Now, there are specific terms that go with this, the noetic and the numinous. The noetic is that which is in the mind, and the numinous is that dynamic kinetic power. And when the dynamic kinetic power is in the room, it can manifest in different ways. Um, you saw some of it this morning. I, I was, it was a good exhibition, actually, but I've seen others that are possibly even more eye-opening. Um, but anyway, this is really at the core of what we mean in the power of God. Now, Christian and Jewish theology both have a long history of talking about the power of God. But in general, Christians tend to talk about what God once did in the past uh, rather than his present acts of power. And among the Jews, they aren't even thinking about this for the most part, except among a few Messianic groups. So when we talk about the current move of God and we talk about the power of God, you have to understand this. If you hear nothing else about this message, hear this. This is the conclusion, but I'm putting it up front. Anytime we minister or preach, anytime we minister or preach. Now, you may not ever stand in a pulpit, but you might share with somebody, I don't know, down at Starbucks or bump into someone at Home Depot or you see the grocery checker who's in a bad way and you want to, you know, pray for her or him there at the grocery store, okay, whatever, okay? Any of these places where you may intersect with people, we are always doing what we do, whether in prayer or preaching or whatever, unto a release of God's power with the hope and expectation that everybody will experience that power, period, full stop. That's what we are seeking to do. Anything less than that isn't that. And because in so many of our circles and churches, we have not held clearly to that, uh, we substitute a lot of other things. We bring in formulas. We decree and declare. We name it and claim it. We run through the wooden mechanical five-step model, not really thinking that anything's going to come out of it, but it's just this is what we do in our faith tradition. So we do the five-step prayer model and nobody gets healed. And we go, how come it's not working? We prayed the five-step model and it's because there's no power. As I said in the other message, we're not trying to conceptualize or mentally assent to power. Maybe we say, I think I've experienced the power of God. If you think you've experienced the power of God, trust me, you haven't. It's a bit like going skydiving. I went to skydiving school. I learned how to pack the parachute. They told me to pull the cord this many seconds after I jump out of the plane. I know all about skydiving. Did you jump out of a plane? Uh, no. You haven't been skydiving. Oh, but I've got the certificate. Don't even talk to me about it. You haven't been skydiving. You could change it and say scuba diving, but you get the idea. There's some things you just have to experience with that. And so there's a tangibility to God's power. It's akin to electricity, but it isn't electricity. I've seen instances of this in various places. I'm thinking of one country I went to. I went to this church that um, the pastor knew me for a long time, and he knew what he was asking for and I was with them for a week and we had different meetings each day you know the men's ministry the kids ministry the ladies the ministry team blah 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 we had all this stuff and he had a assistant pastor that worked for him and this guy had gotten very good marks in his theological training and he'd even written papers on the power of God but he really knew absolutely nothing about the power of God except theory and so every single meeting that we were doing he would be somewhere near the back, often maybe in this setting. It would be just out there in the foyer. He might be looking through the glass, listening to the speaker that's, you know, piping it in. Or maybe he'd have the door cracked and he'd be kind of looking like this. But he wouldn't dare come in the room. And, um, you know, he'd kind of seen a lot of things going on, on and off through the week. And on the last night um, I was there, we had a meeting with the prayer ministry team. And it was about 80 people. It was a bigger church and they had a pretty good sized prayer team so I taught on whatever I taught on and 
at the end, I said, there's somebody here, you've got metal in your wrist. Uh, you got it in some sort of a fall. And you, even though they fixed your wrist with the metal, it's never been fully correct. And God wants to heal you. Who are you? Well, there's this woman back here, and she puts up her hand. I didn't know this, but it was convenient. She was the head of the prayer team. So everybody in the room knew her. And she comes walking to the front, and as she walks to the front, I happen to, you know, I'm looking at her, and as I did, my eyes shifted, and I see this assistant pastor, and he's kind of peeking in the door. And she gets to the front, and as she gets very close, she hasn't quite hit the front yet, the Lord says to me, tell her to face the room and stretch out her hand. So she got to the front, and she's looking at me, and I said, turn around. So he turned around, and I said, now, stretch out your hand. And that particular church was made out of a, a local substance that we don't really use in the United States, but the nearest analog to it would be brick. They call it rammed earth. But anyway, it's, it's a very hard acoustical substance in terms of sound properties. And so as she stretches out her hand, there's a very pronounced like that. And it bounces off the walls, and everybody hears it. And they all look at her, and she, she's right there, and I'm kind of just to the side here. She looks over her shoulder at me. She goes, I've just been healed. And I said, really? And she goes, yeah, look. And she drops down and starts doing push-ups. This woman is like, I don't know, 75 years old. And as I, as I take my eyes off of her doing push-ups... I see that assistant pastor, I see his backside, and I see afterburners lit full. He's heading out. That man didn't know anything about the power of God. In fact, he was afraid of the power of God. And he didn't understand that you need that power to fix a metal plate in someone's wrist. You're not going to just, you know, walk your way into that one. Well, that's an example I have other ones, but that kind of illustrates it. So when we talk about this power, we're trying to recapture something of the essence of early Christianity. The essence of early Christianity. Paul put it this way, my speech and my message were not in plausible words of human wisdom, but in a demonstration of the Spirit, meaning it's observable, it's tangible, it's measurable, but in a demonstration of the Spirit and of power so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. I mean, I hope I speak well and preach well, but I would much rather have God's power confirm what I say than that I be the best orator in North America. And then he goes on and he says, 1 Corinthians 4.20, for the kingdom of God does not consist in words and talk, but in power. So power is the game. It's the money shot. And however we get there, we want to become conductors of power. We want to be, well, the ideal would be to become like a superconductor. Superconductivity is something that, you know, physicists are talking about these days. It generally only occurs in very, very, very cold temperatures. But, of course, they're seeking to find ways to make it work at room temperature. Because with superconductivity, you can generate power out of a power plant and move it an infinite distance through electrical lines and there will be no what power guys call line loss. The degradation of the voltage as distance increases because of the impurities in the metal. This is I think similar to what John says to Jesus the Lord gave, the Father gave the spirit without measure. There was no limitation. But there, there are times when we become superconductors and there are some people maybe like John Lake or others who seem to be veritable all the time superconductors. And so this thing of power is really way more important than many of the formulas and things like this that we often hear about. Now, the power of God is unique to God. There's nobody else in the universe who has this. And um, it's self-sufficient. It's actually an expression of God himself. This is why when the Lord speaks to Moses, he says, I am who I am. I, I don't depend on anybody. And nobody names me. I call the shots here and I name myself. And so say to the people of Israel, I am has sent me. Not only that, the power of God is creative. The scripture says he created the world by his power. Jeremiah 10, 12. 
which also tells us, incidentally, that the power of God is a key component of the prophetic ministry. At least good, solid, valid prophetic ministry. I'll just throw this in here. It's not in the teaching, but it just FYI, next year, next year in October, um, we're going to do a conference on miracles and prophecy where we're going to try to describe how that fusion of power and the prophetic happen. Um, we've got some first-rate theologians, Craig Keener, Jack Deere that will be speaking at it. Chris Reed will be a speaker. Um, I'll be a speaker. Um, we've got a first-rate physicist, a uh, Christian physicist, who will describe for us how these things work in physics. And this is not what you heard from Vancouvering or somebody else. This is from a real legit physicist with a postdoc in it. And he'll talk to us about that. We're going to try and find that thing so hopefully we can connect with it. Um, anyway, we don't know yet where it'll be. It could be in uh, maybe down in the south somewhere. It may be out west. We aren't advertising it yet, but just keep your eyes peeled in our newsletter and on our website. It'll be, it'll be advertised there. Um, and we've got a couple of other people coming too. Okay, so he created the world by his power. And we know that he created the world through Jesus because in the beginning was the word and the word was with him. Where the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with, with God. Through him all things were made. And the scripture also says, not only did he create the word by his power, but he did it through wisdom, Proverbs 3.19. And so Jesus Christ has become for us the wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, 1 Corinthians 1.30. So of all things were made through him, it's because he is the wisdom of God and he is the word of God and he is the creative power of God. And so when we talk about power, the only way to get it is to be in Jesus. It's radically Christocentric. Muslims need not apply. Hindus need not apply. Sikhs, Jains, they need not apply. Now, if they want to change positions and become Christians, they can apply. But this is, this is unique for us, and it's because we are the bearers of his spirit. And so um, the power of God not only creates, it sustains. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. In fact, the scripture says, he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. But here's the thing about power. It is itself a reflection of the glory of God. We use the word glory in many settings, but this thing of power is interrelated with the glory of God. We'll talk about that in a second. So the power of God is miraculous. In fact, it releases the miraculous. The word most commonly rendered as power from the Greek is the word dunamis. It's the word that we get the word miracles from in English, and it's also the word that's often translated dynamite. So it's, it's, it's not just some power, it's that power. And it reflects the coming age, as I've said a couple of times this weekend, which is a foretaste of the life to come. And all of these are interrelated. Because in Exodus 33, Moses is praying and he says, If I've found favor in your sight, please show me your ways that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Now that's an interesting statement. If I found favor, show me your ways that I may know you and find favor. But I thought you had favor. Yeah, but you can go to more favor. And the way you get more favor is by following the ways of God. Of course, the reverse is true too. You violate the ways of God, your favor with God may decline. It's not that he won't love you. It's just that you're introducing impurities into what should be a superconductor. And so the favor quotient is not as high. I know that sounds like works righteousness, but it's not. You're saved by grace. But the way you walk with God is an altogether different issue. And so Moses is praying for this because he doesn't want to move on from the place where they are. And God responds to him, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And he said to him, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. So Moses basically is saying, thanks for that, God. But if you won't go with us with presence, we don't want to budge from where we are. And by the way, that has nothing to do with what I'm really after. I asked you for favor. You said you would you know, show me your ways in order to give me more favor. 
thank you for the presents. But he says, how will it be known that I have found favor in your sight? I in your people, is it not with your going with us? Is it not with your presence so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth? This is to be the hallmark of the people of God, that we are spirit bearers and everybody around us knows it. Now, this could reflect in different ways. People may say, you're not like the other people in this office building. You don't bat bite and gossip. You remain cheerful. You you don't steal, you show up early and go home late, you, you know, all of that, you're a little different, you're quirky, you're too honest. I had one boss say that to me one time. He said, you're never going to make it here. You make a mistake and you own it instead of trying to fob it off on other people. So there's a lot of ways that that becomes known. But the point is, the people of God should be known by this. And if you aren't having some amount of feedback of that sort from your peer group outside the church something is wrong with your walk with God I'm not saying it has to happen every week but if it's been five years and no one has said anything to you like that you better be checking your own life yeah really I mean that all right so Moses he's appreciative of the presence but he wants more and so he says what, he, what we just discussed, and the Lord said to Moses, this very thing that you have spoken, I will do, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses, petition granted. And Moses said, this is going pretty well. I think I'll up the ante. Please show me your glory. And God's answer to that is, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. If you want to see the glory of God, you'll see it in his goodness. Now, goodness could include things like healing and miracles. It could include provision. It could include other overt demonstrations of his power, but all of these are symptoms. They're manifestations of his glory. There are other ways the glory can also be experienced in fact as Moses is saying this we have two accounts that describe what's being observed externally as Moses is having this exchange with God the first one of them is in Exodus 19 and in Exodus 19 verses 18 to 20 it says now Mount Sinai was wreathed in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire and the smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled greatly. Think about that. A mountain with its top on fire, and the whole mountain is shaking. And it's not, you know, just a jolt. It's like this rolling thing that keeps on going. And the sound of the trumpet grows louder and louder, and Moses spoke, and God answered him in thunder. Lord, show me your glory. <laughs> well, that's a supernatural experience. But here's the other thing that describes that same time frame, Moses, uh, Exodus 24. The glory, here it is, the word glory. He said, show me your glory. The glory of the Lord dwelt on Mount Sinai and the cloud covered it six days and on the seventh day he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. I mean, if you aren't a little bit afraid after six days of watching that to enter the cloud, this is why the people down the mountain are like, make us a golden calf. We don't know what happened to Moses. Well, Moses doesn't know what's going to happen to Moses. And, you know, sometimes we're all in this, oh, yeah, he's my papa and he loves me. This, too, is our God. And there should be that kind of reverent fear that goes with it. But now watch this, verse 17. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the sight of the people of the Lord. 
Well, it said the Mount Sinai was wreathed in smoke. The Lord descended on it in fire. But note, it does not say that it's actually fire. It's the appearance of the glory, and it was like fire. It might have been fire, or maybe it just looked like something was consumed. But you know kind of what this is describing. This, The word in Greek is effulgence. It's the outflowing. If you've ever seen the sun and you put a disc over it so you don't burn your eyes out, that thing that comes off the edge of the sun, the corona, that it's shining effulgence, that's what's going on. And Jesus is that effulgence. He's that glory. And this is what Moses is seeing. And so Moses said, I want to see your glory. And the Lord says, you can't look at my face. Now, it's interesting that it says that. Because actually back in chapter 20 of Exodus, it says Moses used to go into the tent and he would speak face to face with God. So how can he speak face to face with God, but he can't see his face? That's an interesting question. Most of the really interesting insights in the Bible come from what appear to be stuff like that that could be taken as contradictory. So the Lord says, I'll put you in a cleft of the rock and I'll pass by and then I'll take my hand away and you'll see my back. What's the Lord telling him? Well, he's telling him that he has a humanoid figure, a shape. Man was created in the image of God. So maybe the more accurate way to say it is we have a deoid shape, meaning shaped like God, rather than God is shaped like us. You can, you can clearly understand why that's an important distinction. We're not, we're made in God's image. God's not made in our image. We respond to him. He doesn't respond to us. I mean, he does, but he doesn't answer to our beck and call. We answer to his beck and call. So all of that's going on, but Moses doesn't quite get what's happening here. He's accustomed to speaking, but he doesn't see anything when he's getting this face-to-face -face thing. But God says, I'll put you on the mountain, I'll pass by, and then I'll remove my hand and you'll see my back. And what Moses now understands is that, again, the Lord has a shape, and we are in that shape as well. And so what this is telling us is that 1,500 years before Jesus was born, Moses saw Jesus. But he saw him back. He didn't see his face. He couldn't yet see his face. That's why my face cannot be seen. Because God is one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but nobody knew about the Son at this time. They only knew about this one God that called himself I Am. So this is a complete shifting of the paradigm. And Moses doesn't fully figure this out, but, but in the revelatory exchanges he has, he understands something. So now the Lord says, I'm going to show you my glory by declaring my name. So the Lord declares his name. 34, 5, the Lord descended in the, in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord, as he had said he would do. And this is why the cloud matters. This is why the fire on the mountain matters. And the Lord passed before him, and this is what he said, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and, full, and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands and forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. We love that part of the revelation of God. It fits what we are all about in our modern concepts of God. But here is the other part of the name of God, and we don't like this part of God's name. He will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. Yeah, we don't like that one. That sounds like mean God, unhappy God, vicious God. But the answer, how do these two fit together? When he takes his hand away, justice and mercy meet in the person of the Son. And so Moses sees that revelation, and God says, there's my glory. In that man, who won't even be born for 15 centuries, there is where the glory is found. And that's what Moses saw. That's what John saw. That's what the writer to the Hebrews is talking about. And so the power of God comes through Jesus. It's unmediated contact with God when power is moving. You're literally coming into contact with God himself. Now, it's, you know, that much because, I mean, he holds the whole universe in his hands. I mean, he created everything. 
He has the power to speak things into existence. But that little tiny bit, you, you get a drop of it, and it's like, whoa, and you wig out. So some of you had that happen this morning. We were praying, and boom, you know, getting knocked over, falling down. Not everybody needed a catcher, but that's what it is. But here's the thing. This power is the thing that releases healing. In Luke 4.14, Jesus returns to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. And word about him goes out everywhere. Luke 4.14. That followed his baptism, and it also followed his testing by the devil in the desert. You don't move into the realm of power without consecration and testing. And so you may be saying, well, God, I want the power. And then you get fired from your job. You and your husband or wife have a fight. Your children go astray, and you're like, but God, I prayed. Well, now you're in the wilderness. Now you're being tested by the devil. you got to pass that test to come out and return to Galilee, your home area, in the power of the Spirit. No one escapes this. Nobody. So you go, well, but God, can you make an exception? Nope. Jesus is the divine pattern. Everything he went through, he did to be like us. That means we got to be like him. <laughs> right? So Jesus returned in the, to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. Just like he said, wait in Jerusalem until you are clothed with power from on high, he waited in the desert until he was clothed with power from on high. Same principles apply. Luke 5, 17, the power of the Lord was present for healing. The man that I mentioned earlier, this is the paralyzed man, four friends come bringing him. The power is there. He releases a word of forgiveness to that man for whatever that was that he needed forgiveness for. And now he says, rise and walk. And that word alone, the creative power that created the universe, summons life into his bones. And he comes off the stretcher. That's the power. This is no decree and declare. This is no wooden name it and claim it. This is no run through the five-step model. This is the dynamic, kinetic, electric-like power of God. Everything that we do should be like this. And I don't care which healer you study. Catherine Kuhlman, she knew this all the time. Oh, the Holy Spirit is moving. Up there is a man in a blue jacket. Sir, the Lord heals you. Whammo! What happened? In that case, the word she spoke released the power that healed him. Sometimes it happens through the laying on of hands. Sometimes it comes because you put oil on people. Sometimes you pour water on their head. Sometimes Jesus spit on their tongue. But all of this is designed to release power. We, we have to become reacquainted with this. Luke 6, 19. People sought to touch Jesus in order that they would be healed. That the power of God would heal them and all who touched him were healed because power was flowing out of him when you are a conductor of power it flows out of you in fact the word authority in greek exousia look at that there 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 don't have any up here all of these doors have over them the word exit that's a Latin word that's drawing from Greek, and it means go out here. The word ex means out. Ex usia means out of something. What's usia? The substance, the divine substance. Jesus had authority because it flowed out of the substance of him as the second person of the Godhead. It couldn't be held back, and you are baptized into him. Therefore, exousia should be flowing out of you. And if it isn't, it's because you've stopped being a superconductor, or maybe you never knew that you could be. Back to our discussion from the last session in this afternoon, dealing with the wiring of the house. I'm giving you, this is, this is the crown jewels of the healing ministry. This is how Benny Hinn operates. I talked about this with every great healer in the South American revival. Omar Cabrera, Carlos Anacondia, every single one of them, they were waiting for the power. You watch a movie of William Branham, and he's waiting for the anointing. He's up there, and then you, bling, you see him. 
What happened? He just got hit with the power, and then all of a sudden, you, sir, come on up here, boom, boom, boom. He's waiting for the power. You guys want to take your game to a new level? It's about power. When I was in Mexico about five years ago or six years ago, we were down in the Yucatan Peninsula. It's kind of wild and woolly down there from a spiritual standpoint. We had a meeting in this church called Mundo de Fe, which for anyone who speaks Spanish is the world of faith. So Mundo de Fe, we're in this church and we've got hundreds of people. The place is so crowded, every aisle is filled with people. People are sitting on the steps. They're up on the platform with me. I've got you know about this much room to move back and forth. It's literally jam-packed. Fire code, no one heard of it. All right, so we're having these meetings and somebody says, Ken, we gotta go. We got planes to catch. It's time now, we gotta stop. So it's like, okay. So, you know, the end, bye. <laughs> Grab the stuff. We're starting to head out. Well, literally, it's jam-packed. You can't go anywhere. So they opened a channel for us. And you all know what a fire tunnel is. I don't need to explain that. It becomes a reverse fire tunnel. We go through the fire tunnel, and every person who touches us, not me, us, the team, is being healed. It's Luke 619 all over again because so much power was flowing out of us. Boom, boom, boom. They're just... <laughs> They're getting lit up because they touched us. This literally happened. I don't have 20 stories like that, but what I know is if it can happen once, it can happen 100 times. I'm looking back there at my friend Ramsey, and uh, I was in his nation about eight years ago. We were meeting it in some basements in Amman, Jordan. And Muslims were coming from everywhere. We started with Christians, but so many people were being healed that they started going and getting their neighbors and friends and whatnot. And so pretty soon we have this you know, Muslim group. And in the four days I was there, I slept a total of seven hours. Not a night, total. Because they wouldn't let me leave. They're bringing in food to keep me eating so I won't drop. And, you know, we're... But there was so much power, people are bringing them. And in that four days, I led 300 Muslims to the Lord. Because they were convinced by what was happening as their mothers and uncles and children were being healed. Their neighbors and their fathers and so on it went. And, you know, at a couple points, I was like, guys, I need to go home and go to bed. And they're like, oh, no, we've been waiting for hours. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, I'm going to be killed in a Muslim in Amman or in a basement in Amman, and they'll never find my body. And they might nail a fingernail home to my wife, you know. But anyway, I, you know, I, we finished those meetings out. I've seen this dynamic. I'm not preaching theory here. But I'm not saying you're often going to touch it unless you understand it and intentionally go after it. And that means laying aside a lot of the things that people are doing right now in modern charismatic renewaldom that aren't working as they're looking for something, and this is what it is. So we're in this meeting in Mexico. They do the reverse fire tunnel. We get to the staircase back out there, and it's, it's not exactly circular. It's more like a square staircase. But anyway, we start going down the staircase, and there's so much power coming off of our bodies that people who are crammed in the staircase trying to hear the meeting upstairs, they're being cut down by the power of God, and they tumble to the ground. It's like clearing the way for us as these bodies go falling down the stairs. Wow. Literally. I'm not exaggerating. This actually happened. So we come down the stairs and we walk out into the street. It's southern Mexico. The sun's out. And everywhere I look, it's a sea of people who have been trying to get in who can't get in. And many of them are on stretchers. Many of them are in wheelchairs. And as we walk by, no kidding, our shadows are hitting them and they're getting out of their wheelchairs and being healed. This is what we see in Acts chapter 3. Again, I don't have 20 stories like this, but if it can happen once, it can happen again. If you don't know that this is what you're after, you don't know what you're after. If you can see it, you can have it. Luke 8, 46. 
there was a woman who apparently missed the Luke 6, 19 meeting. But she'd heard about it. Obviously heard about it because she says, if I can just touch the fringe of his garment, if I can just do that, it'll be enough. And so she gets near, and we don't know exactly how she did it. <laughs> did she reach over? Did she put her hand through? Did she get down low? And I don't know, but whatever she did, that's what she did. And she says, if I can just touch him, and she does, and Jesus stops. He says, who touched me? And Peter, the master, look at all these people. Everybody's pressing in. No, no, there was one who touched me that way, for I perceive that virtue has gone out of me. And she realizes, I've been had. So she goes, uh, I did it, sir, I'm sorry. But her flow of blood was stopped. Yeah. That's what the healing is about. Yeah. Power. Luke 24, 49. Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. But I want you to wait for him before you go into the world. You will not be able to accomplish what I am sending you to do without that. There it is, Luke 24, 49. Oh, by the way, boys, in case you didn't get the memo the first time, Acts 1, 8, also written by Luke, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You will be mantled in power. You will be clothed with power from on high. Then... Like Saul of old, do whatever your hand finds to do, for God is with you. And when God is with you, no one can be against you. Not the forces of hell, not the federal government of the United States. It doesn't matter who it is. You will simply go and preach, and I will be with you. He said, if you will preach, lo, I am with you always to the end of the age. That's what this is about. And so with that, we see a picture, Acts 4.33, the apostles with great, gave, excuse me, the apostles gave testimony with great power, which is more than mere conviction to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Power can be actually quite quiet. I mean, preachers sort of, you know, thrive on being rambunctious and all that, but sometimes it's very quiet. Catherine Kuhlman, again, very good illustration of this. Oh, the precious Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. Oh, he's here now. He's moving now. Oh, I perceive his goodness. Oh, yes. Holy Spirit, we love you. There's no yelling. There's no shouting in that. It's just her and her Scottish brogue. And then... <laughs> this is the way it rolls. Paul said to the Ephesian church... Ephesians 1.19, I pray that the eyes of your heart would be enlightened, that you would know the hope of your calling, and that you would know the surpassing greatness of the power that is directed toward you. He's got you in his sights. Think of a rifle scope painted on your head. He wants to paint you with the power. And I pray that your eyes would be opened, that they would be enlightened, that the lights would come on. There's that wiring illustration once again, that you may know the hope to which he has called you and what are the riches of his glorious inheritance of the saints. Well, according to Peter, <clears throat> whatever else this means, it means you are made a partaker, one who drinks from the divine nature. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power directed toward us who believe? Which is in accordance with the working of his great might, his great power, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. This is take a deep drink from the resurrection power of Jesus. It was by the same Holy Spirit <clears throat> into which, into whom we are baptized that Jesus was raised from the dead, one in the same spirit. And so we see in all of these verses that I've just given you from 
Luke and Acts, and now Ephesians, that healing comes through power. It comes through that dynamic kinesis, the moving of the Spirit of the Lord. I'm always wanting that. I'm always looking for that. One of the saddest verses in the whole Bible is of Samson. He was clothed in power, but he wist not, which is King Jamesy, but it's the way I memorized the verse under my grandma's tutelage. He did not know that the Spirit of the Lord had left him. The modern church has come to a place where we think that we have it all figured out with our various formulas. But you can't bottle the Spirit of God, except in your own body, because it is the temple of the Holy Spirit. But for that to happen, you have to be a fit vessel. And then he will use you in that way. Now, this matter of the power returned in a big way <clears throat> to the worldwide church 116 years ago. It was known as Azusa Street. And in 1906, William Seymour began preaching that revival. Good, reliable records are a little hard to find, but there are some eyewitness accounts of things that went on there. And the, the, the great glory there ran from 06 to 09, and then it was pretty well spent. But of course, you know, there's always a church left behind or something. And so that stable in downtown Los Angeles was kind of a marker for some period of time, years but as they say, the cloud had moved. And it's really out of that that Lake and Bosworth, whom we've mentioned, it's really out of that that they began their ministry together. And they crisscrossed the country for a while, and then again, they parted ways, stayed friends, but they parted ways. So if you will, Lake and Bosworth were the spiritual sons of William Seymour. That's the language we use today. They were at their prime in the teens and into the early 20s of the 20th century. And uh, along the way, because they originated in Los Angeles, they met a young woman. There's nothing untoward about what went on there. We need to say that these days because we live in such a licentious society. But they met a young woman named Amy. Her, her maiden name was Amy Semple. She became the founder of the Foursquare denomination. She built a church on the edge of Los Angeles, about a mile and a half from the Azusa Street Mission. I've been to both, although the mission doesn't exist anymore. It was torn down years ago. The state of California has an office building there, but they do have a big plaque that says, on this site was the original Azusa Street Mission, which is reckoned as the beginning of worldwide Pentecostalism, of which there are known to be more than 500 million adherents around the world. But about a mile and a half, uh, slightly to the north, mostly to the east, Amy built Angelus Temple on the edge of Echo Park. She built a church on five levels. 1,000 people per level could sit in it. Um, and it became the start of the Foursquare denomination. Uh, today, there's 15 million adherents to the Foursquare around the world. Unfortunately, much of the Foursquare has lost the fire. Uh, but they were, they were birthed in fire. <clears throat> and during the Great Depression, during the 30s, um, her church alone rendered more assistance to the citizens of greater Los Angeles than the combined city, county, state, and federal governments uh, in that area. And so this created a kind of um, competition between Amy and them. But anyway, she is the spiritual granddaughter of William Seymour by way of John Lake and F.F. F. Bosworth. Well, another young woman was rattling around in L.A. during the latter years of Amy's ministry. Um, her name was Catherine Kuhlman. And uh, she came under Amy's tutelage, and she doesn't need any introduction. We've made reference to her already. But she becomes the spiritual great-granddaughter of William Seymour. It's said by people who should know 
that when Catherine Kuhlman died, her mantle, as we like to say, was torn into seven strips. I've talked to some people about that. No one's completely sure who the seven strips went to, except for three. But before I talk about that, I want to show you a series of photos. Okay, phone's on silent. Whoever that is that's ringing should not be. This is a holy moment. The Spirit of the Lord is here. He's going to do something with what I'm saying. I'm just waiting for that moment. This is the grave of William Seymour in Los Angeles. I visited there about eight years ago and took these photos. Um, that's the ground plate that's right in front of the headstone. It just says who he is and what he did. But the, here's, a, here's a picture that you should look at. And something should be very obvious to you, namely that the whole cemetery is dead brown, except the grave is not. And the grass is about a foot long there in that picture. So when I saw this, I went and found the sexton, and I said, does anyone come and water this grave? He goes, no, no one ever comes. I said, well, why is it so green? He goes, I don't know. It never dies. It's always green. This is an unretouched, unphotoshopped photograph that I took myself with my own camera. Yeah, you can come up and look at it. That's the grave of William Seymour. And like I said, that grass is about a foot long. And it was crazy. The day we were there was 103 degrees. And um, I, you know, kind of put my hands down in the grass. And it was wet. There's my friend kneeling next to the gravestone. There's me, there's me. There it is again, a full-on shot. You can see how brown everything is, except right there where the body would be lying. Well, this shows you how we are supposed to be conductors of the power. And like Elisha's bones, or Elisha's bones, they could throw a dead man on it and he would come back to life. The power is still exuding from the grave of William Seymour. Again, unretouched, unphotoshopped, that I took, um, there's a kind of a step back angle. You can see all the dead brown. And another one, more dead brown. And that's it. Okay, so I show you all that because I want you to understand what we're talking about. As they say, a picture's worth a thousand words. Seeing is believing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> well, Catherine Kuhlman is the great, spiritual great granddaughter of William Seymour and if you go on YouTube you can fact check this one easily she had some followers one of whom was a young uh, fresh faced man at the time named Lonnie Frisbee he became the leader of the Jesus people revival globally with that same spirit and he received one of the seven strips of her mantle when she passed. The other two that I've been able to verify with certainty were Benny Hinn and Mario Murillo. And now you know why they function as they do. As I said, this is not about formulas. This is not about recitation. This is about power. <clears throat> well, Lonnie Frisbee came to our church in Anaheim, California in 1980. And uh, he made a huge deposit at our church. A lot of the young adults in our church received something from him. John Wimber himself received something, although John already was carrying a lot. So it's not sure, it's not obvious to me how much of an upgrade it was for John, but I know how much of an upgrade it was for a lot of other people. And, uh, and so Lonnie passed this. He would be the spiritual great-great-grandson of William Seymour. Um, and then, of course, John went around the world and did what he did. And <clears throat> I worked with John. I knew him. I knew Lonnie. I was lucky enough to get to travel with Lonnie for about a year. But I didn't really know at the time everything that I was experiencing. Or I mean, I, I knew it was amazing, but I didn't have language for all of this. And then, of course, John Wimber was the one who launched Randy Clark into what he does. Randy needs no introduction. Um, so what I'm describing for you is a spiritual heritage. 
And I don't think, just like that cemetery shows a grave with green grass, I don't think the river has stopped flowing. I don't think the grass has stopped growing. And I think it's in the mind and the intention of the Lord that there be a transmission of this into another group of people, maybe at a church called King of Kings. In Basking Ridge, New Jersey. I don't know how long you'll be basking. <laughs> maybe you'll be baking, but whatever it's going to be. But this thing of the power, as you can see, just by the names I've dropped here, is not to be underestimated. And it shows you why all of the other stuff that's being talked about, I think it's well-intentioned, but it, a lot of it's just, it's just not the real deal. And we want the real deal. And so what I would like to do, I know that a lot of you still want prayer for healing. That's fine. We're going to do that. But what I'd like to do is I'd like to lay hands on people to release whatever this is. I've told you the branch of succession, how it comes down. Um, so, you know, if Lonnie's the great, great grandson of William Seymour, uh, you can include John in this or not. He'd be the great, great, great. Um, I don't know. I don't know what I have. I don't know what I don't have. People say all kinds of things, and I'm not into the whole self-promotion thing. I'll just say this: I was around Lonnie. I was around John, and I think whatever they had, I caught something. So whatever that is, I'd like to. I'd like to give it away, with the objective that you guys can go do this. Now, it can take you in a lot of directions. Some of you might end up as miracle workers rather than healers. That wouldn't be so bad. Except it means you'll be in a lot of hard places. Usually miracles happen when the chips are down. So, you know, might be challenged there. Some of you might become prophets. Some of you might, I don't know. You know, the Spirit blows where he wills. And so it is with everyone born of the Spirit. But if you'd like to receive of that, um, be, just to accelerate this, I'm going to lay hands on my team and then I and the team will lay hands on you. Otherwise, it might take longer. And once we finish the impartation, assuming, I don't know what's going to happen, but some of you might end up whacked. Okay, if you are, stay whacked. <laughs> uh, but once we've kind of gotten through that, then we can transition to praying for those of you that still need healing. Um, and then we'll close the service. It'll be a little bit over time, but I think it's worth it. I think it's worth it. So team, come on up. You know who you are. This is going to be fun. <laughs> Shaba. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. All right. We're missing Judas only. Somebody got the joke. All right. Let's just go before the Lord. Lord, this is a holy moment, and we've just shared a great piece of holy history from the 20th and 21st centuries. And Lord, we thank you for this precious gift of the Holy Spirit. I can't say it the way that Catherine Coleman would, but I feel the same way. Without him, we can do nothing. And he joins us to you as members of the vine. And Lord, you told us we should wait for power from on high, from the Holy Spirit. And so this is why we've come. This is why we're here. And Lord, we just, we just say, descend on us in this room. Not just this team, but this whole room. Lord, you know what we're doing here. Moses went out to the tent and you put your spirit on him and the 72 elders beyond that in order that this could come to all Israel. And Moses even said, would to God that all the Lord's people were prophets. And so, Lord, we just ask you in this room, in this place today, that just as the 72 gave it out to their tribe, six men per tribe. Lord, we ask that as we lay hands on these 11, 
and then they lay hands on the rest of the room with me, we ask that there would be a transmission of this power that I've been speaking of. We don't want the cheap substitute. We'll give up all the formulas. We'll throw out all the books, all the manuals. And we'll just say, Lord, give us the power. That's all we want is the power so we can carry out the work you've given us to do. Lord, let it be today. Pentecost Sunday just passed us last weekend. So Lord, let this be our season of Pentecost in the name of Jesus. When we receive it in the name of Jesus. Receive the power of the Holy Spirit passing down through these generations from Azusa Street. Receive the power of the Holy Spirit. Move in this, flow in this. Let the wind of God take you. We yield to you, Holy Spirit. We offer you our lives. We offer you our sacred honor. We ask you that you would do this for your own glory, that we would touch and see what Moses was privileged to touch and to see. And Lord, with this, that you would release something here that would be enough to turn America around. We're only asking you for a nation. It's not too much for you, Lord. We ask you, let this happen to all that are present today. In the name of Jesus, take that, Ruth, take it. Take that in Jesus' name. Bless you, Woj. Bless you. Yes, 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 Lord, we need something like a new Azusa Street. We need something to come out of these meetings that literally shifts things. That's what we're asking you for. The breakout of the kingdom of God by the person of the Spirit in the name of Jesus to the glory of the Father. That's what we're asking for, nothing less. Yes, Lord, yes. Yes, Lord, yes. might not even realize it, but we have up here PhDs, doctors, Wall Street analysts, scientists, professors in universities. These are not people who are prone to emotional exhibition. And they're not doing this just because I laid hands on them to make it look like the great man is doing his thing. They are receiving impartation with the objective of turning around and slapping it on you. Holy Spirit, descend on the room. Make these hearts ready. They had to wait 10 days for the Spirit to come between Ascension and Pentecost in the New Testament. Lord, we don't have 10 days, but we can wait a few minutes. The Holy Spirit, come on us. Descend on us. Some of you are already feeling the power descend. Lord, we bless that power. In the name of Jesus, we bless that power. Shukri's making his way up to the front. He's like, I want that. I want it for Jordan. I want it for this country. Spirit. Phineas Brzee was part of that great outpouring and one of his famous sayings, keep the glory down. Don't let it ascend. Don't let it come up. Keep the glory down. All you need to do is be reverent. Be an empty vessel and say, fill me, Lord. Every known thing within me, 
that is defiling or unclean, I lay it aside. So help me, God, I will not return to it. All right, if you're ready in your heart to come up, come on up. Let's see what the Lord will do.